I'm tempted to say, don't adjust your dial. <laughs> but I know you're not watching this on a cathode ray tube TV. Um, that's a sneak preview of our guest today, and I'll introduce him very soon. But first, welcome to Careers Takeoff, where you learn the latest about how you can get ahead in your career. I'm your host, Conrad Chua. Today, our guest is Richard Newman, the founder of Body Talk, a company that has trained 80,000 people across 45 different geographies. And they've helped this huge community communicate better to get much better business results. Body Talk has also trained our MBAs here in Cambridge. Now, a reminder, you can pop questions for Richard or myself about how you can improve your virtual communications in the comments, whether you're watching this on Facebook or LinkedIn. And even if you don't have any questions, you can always try to ask Richard how Tibetan monks played a role in body talk. So welcome, Richard. Hi, Conrad. Great to be with you uh, today. And uh, hi to everybody who's watching. So really looking forward to sharing something valuable with you here and uh, do pop some comments in there. Very happy to take your questions on virtual communication, business communication, your life in communication using Teams or WebEx or uh, using Zoom over the course of uh, this year and into next year uh, as well. So anything that you'd like to ask around business communication, very happy to take your questions. But uh, Con Conrad, thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure, Richard. Um, Richard, usually we would have been meeting face to face, but as in the case for everyone in the world, we're just seeing each other in these little squares on our devices. How do you feel that virtual communication or the need to do this virtual communication has changed the way business is conducted? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And uh, you know, I've been discussing this so much with our clients uh, recently about how life has changed and therefore you know, how the training that we we're providing for clients has also had to adapt uh, towards that. Not just that we can't be in a classroom and we're doing it via video, but there's a lot of shifts that we've seen this year. So uh, first of all, something for everybody to keep in mind is the, the element of trust in communication. So I was speaking about this with a few people uh, recently, and one of our clients said, it's very difficult doing business when you can't smell the other person. And what he meant by that is that when you're in a room with somebody else, uh, there is a, a chemistry between the two of you, something that's unspoken about being in a room with somebody else and gaining a sense of who they are as a person. They gain a sense of you, and a lot of that can happen in an unspoken way. And then when you are having the exact same conversation with them, even with someone who's known you for 10 or 20 years, and you're doing it virtually, you're doing it through a camera and a microphone, that ability to sense the other person is highly diminished. And therefore, a lot of the work that we've done with clients this year is around making sure they're very clear on their intentions. So that, I mean, think about this. Uh, if, you're, if you're listening to this, have you had a conversation with somebody this year where you've put forward an idea that's great for them? You really have good intentions. You want to help them. You want to serve them in some way. It's a great idea for them, their team, their company. And they dismiss it or they question you. They're suspicious. And they start to say, but why? What's in it for you? Why are you trying to do this? And you're coming with pure intentions, but they're, they're questioning it. And so, you know, don't take it personally if that's happening because... Uh, people are much more likely to feel suspicious of intentions, to uh, to have a diminished sense of trust if they're not actually able to be in a room with you, which is where a lot of that sort of human connection relationship is built. So we've shifted towards that sense of building up uh, intentions and trust uh, with people. We've also talked about, you know, how do you have a deeper conversation here? So where a lot of our work in the past had been uh, more... Uh, geared towards sort of broadcasting information in team meetings or sales pitches. So much more of the work that we've done this year is on deeper level conversations, uh, because those are the sorts of things that you might have with people on a coffee break or around the water cooler or just bumping into someone in a corridor and, and you, you build up an understanding of them. You just have those casual conversations that are part of working life or if you're one of the students at uh, Cambridge Judge Business School, just bumping into people, having those little bits of banter and conversation. 
that we're having less of now in this virtual world. So how do you make sure that you get there virtually? Uh, because, you know, I've been talking to some people saying that stepping into uncomfortable or challenging moments in conversation, it can feel easier to do that if you're just sitting next to someone, you're having a coffee together and you, you bring up something to, to speak to them about. But that's not as easy to do now. So how do you do it when you're not in the room with someone? So go into that deeper side of conversations and not pulling away from that. Uh, so those are certainly big changes that we've seen in, in the work that we do and the, the needs that people have day to day. Okay, that's very um, interesting, Richard, because I've been through, um, I think everyone has been through sessions uh, where we learn that, what is it, 75, 80% of communication is nonverbal, right? And I think what you're saying is, because of Zoom and Teams, uh, Google Meets, a lot of that is now taken away. So my question is, for people who were very good at communicating in a face-to-face -face sort of setting, they were very good at thinking about that 70 to 80% of nonverbal communications. What should they be doing to, say, regain that sort of trust or gain that sort of trust with uh, mm. the, the audience? or to have those sort of deeper conversations now that if you think about it, a big chunk of their style is gone. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that they, I've seen different approaches people have had this year to the situation. There, there are some people who have relied on that skill all the way through their career of you put them in a room with someone and they get the deal done or they get the um, initiative agreed from, from teams, stakeholders and clients. You, you put them in a room and, and they can get that piece done. And I noticed that there were a few clients who decided, okay, while this lockdown's happening, we're just gonna cancel doing uh, those pitches or we're gonna cancel doing client meetings, we're gonna cancel doing training sessions uh, because they, did, they didn't feel that they could replicate it and they were waiting for this lockdown to ease this virus to, to go away in some way. And now we all know it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, we certainly have clients for the next six months booking up uh, virtual events and not expecting them to happen uh, face to face. Uh, and so that they've then needed to shift and pivot their thinking around these skills. And we've noticed for a lot of people who are very confident face to face, put a camera and a microphone in front of them and that level of confidence disappears. And uh, I think it's actually taken a period of months for many of our clients to reach the point where when you have a Zoom call, you turn your camera on. A lot of people had the, you know, particularly those who are companies using WebEx, it was sort of a tradition over so many years that you, you never turn your camera on apart from if you are the main presenter perhaps of a meeting. So it's taken people a while to get there. But look, if, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, how do I build my confidence up there? Then a, a few things to do. Firstly, straight away, you can start a Zoom call just with yourself, record the meeting and watch what it looks like afterwards. Try uh, changing around how you You've got you know where you are in your house what kind of camera position you're using what kind of microphone you're using just hit record record on my computer for a zoom meeting with yourself and imagine that you're meeting with someone try expressing yourself in different ways try no gestures try doing gestures try changing how you're sitting your, your height your position so you can see that for yourself and get to a place where you go actually it's, it's not that bad. I, I sound all right. This seems okay. I can express myself here to get past any barriers that you're having there. And then you can build into that, okay, who's somebody who I get on great with, who I could try this out with? Uh, so instead of straight away having that challenging conversation with a client, you know, ha have a Zoom meeting, have a, a Microsoft Teams meeting with somebody on your team who you know and trust and will give you honest feedback and say, look, this is what I'm planning to say. This is how I'm planning to say it. Tell me, tell me truthfully, should, should, I, should I be different? Should I be interacting differently? Should, you know, should I do something with the setup that I've got here? How am I gonna shift and change that? Because uh, you know, if you're not doing that, if you're not getting used to this, if you're not improving your impact here, you're genuinely going to be left behind. There are businesses that we've seen that have invested time, money, effort. They've, they've sent webcams and microphones to people's homes. They have you know, given them a little investment in, in making sure that they've got a decent office and a good office chair to, to be able to be um, effective and productive from home. And they're investing in their training to make sure they're doing well. And there's other companies that are resisting that. And then we, you know, when we've had conversations or others have had conversations, you can tell 
their impact in this new era. And it's not going away. This is not going to, you know, when the virus lifts and everyone gets a vaccination or so on, we're not going to go back to the way we were. There's so many of our clients who've said, if you can do it online in future, we're going to do it online. Uh, and so we're having that big shift. So you've got to make sure you get to a place where you feel comfortable and confident to get the same results you were getting before or even better uh, in this, uh, this new medium. Well, Richard, well, Richard as someone who, someone who um, uh, has his own has podcast, his own podcast. I cringe uh, listening to my own voice. So, but I'm going to take your advice and sort of turn the tables on myself. And for this next section, I wanted to ask if you could give um, say a brutal review of how I could improve my own sort of virtual communication style, just the sort of techniques about uh, the techniques that you mentioned, right? The lighting, the camera angle and the audio, and hopefully that can be a useful advice for our listeners. So over to you, Richard. And at the moment, I'm just thinking so self-conscious. Yeah. <laughs> great. Well, I tell you what, actually, uh, for those of you who are listening, um, this would be a great opportunity to, uh, to to pull some feedback. So feel free to pop in the comments here. Uh, any thoughts that you have around uh, Conrad's communication style? You can mention mine as well. I have no problem with that. So, so let's talk about this to get specific. So uh, Conrad, first of all, something that you're doing well that other people should mimic is the height where you, where, as you have it for the, for the camera. Ideally, we want to look at this rule of thirds uh, in a shot and you want to make sure that your eye line is around about one third from the top. So there should be a small gap between the top of the shot and your head and then your eyes want to be around that sort of rule of thirds. So currently because the height that you're sitting at your eyes are about the right line. So it sort of feels like a, uh, a human conversation. Second thing to say is that and, and I, I'll say to everybody listening too, we didn't set this up. This is just how things were, how Conrad set it. Uh, second thing to say is that because of the height that you're at, you're able to gesture towards the camera and make sort of uh, uh, normal fluid movements. And, and we can see those. And that's also a, a great thing for people to think about. Because I mean, think about in the past, when we were all allowed to meet people face to face, how many meetings did you have where you couldn't see someone's hands? It just didn't happen. But, but we, we repeatedly get people who are doing this where, where you, can, you can just about see their heads, maybe a bit of their shoulders, and you never see their hands. And th there's a sense of trustworthiness that goes back to the times where two tribes would meet. You'd want to see the other person's hands to know if they were holding weapons. So being able to see someone's hands, it's critical with that sense of trust. So you've already got that piece uh, working for you. Third piece I would say is around uh, your voice. The pace that you've got and the enunciation on words it is, is crisp and really clear. So, so those things are all working in your favor. Uh, there's a couple of other things that you can think about. So uh, this I would say is we talk to people about making sure you've got a range of different choices so that you can hold people's attention, you can adapt to different messages. So currently where you're at is uh, you've got nice sort of smooth movements, but also then sort of precise and firm movements, which allows you to be in, in modes that we would call the facilitator mode, drawing somebody into a conversation, which is great for, for a podcast guest, or more, if you like, firm commanding position. Sometimes to engage people, depending on the message, you need to be heading more to be more motivational or more entertaining. And to do that requires uh, picking up the pace somewhat and uh, sometimes uh, slightly more goofy movements thrown to one side in, in, in encouraging people to, uh, to, to laugh or, or get levity into the conversation. And that requires that extra piece of sort of fluidity, uh, which uh, for some people they say, but that's not me. And to which I'd say, look, here's your identity. It's all of this. You've got all of this much of an identity. And often what we do is we fall down into one tiny area of our identity rather than taking up the entire piece. We fall into sort of habits. Uh, so, so we can try this out, Conrad, if you'd like to. Mm, so just okay. for this next moment, yeah. you can yeah. aim to uh, you know, speak to me about any subject of your choice. You can you can say whatever you'd like, uh, but, but aim to do it in a, in a slightly more energized way. So you can aim to motivate us about something, maybe a message that's important uh, for you. And then you can add in a little bit of fun with more like jester-like qualities in the way you come across. So it gives that variety. And just, just to say for everybody listening, if you see a great communicator, 
they do all four often in the space of just 60 seconds and it and it brings in your attention just like a song it has uh as a verse and a chorus and a middle eight and those are different and that's why we keep engaged with it because there's a change of rhythm there's a change of pace there's there's a change of feeling that happens because of that so uh so let, let's try that out conrad over to you let's see if you can either go for a bit more of like a a motivated energy or more of a, um, a sort of spirited, goofy, uh, entertainery energy. And I just want to say, oh, Richard, okay. Richard didn't give me any advance notice, so I'm really good. <laughs> That's on right, you're on the spot. Um, all right, so I, for those people who do know me, uh, I'm a lifelong, for my sins, I'm a lifelong fan of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Uh, I grew up in Singapore and we had very little information at the time. So it's just newspapers on a Sunday, you see all the scores and everybody, all my classmates, they just wanted Manchester United, Liverpool. It was so boring. I wanted to be different. So I looked down the table and there was this one club that wasn't a United, wasn't a city. It was Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. And so I spotted them and they, they fooled me by the way, because they were, it was a good team. So. I loved it. I was suddenly popped. I mean, I was suddenly looked like a cool guy because we were winning stuff. And unfortunately, um, we never won very, we didn't win very, very much for the next 30 years. So I'm going to pause you right there. Yeah. Great. So, so we're moving towards, we're going from more sort of uh, slow, more considered towards a bit more energized. And I'm going to suggest because you're more on that considered side, you've gone maybe halfway. And, and okay. if someone was to listen to this and think, how much does he like Tottenham Hotspur? They probably think he quite likes it, but he's not that excited by it. So it already probably feels like a stretch because you're moving away from uh, where we were at the beginning of this conversation. What I'd like you to try now uh, is go even further with it. So whatever you think is completely over the top, so ridiculous that everyone listening to this is going to stop listening because they'll almost be offended by how ridiculous it is. So um, it, it, let's, let's keep going with Tottenham Hotspur and tell me what you love about it and see if you can move your, your arms, uh, keep your energy going in your voice so it feels way, way over the top. Uh, and so as fast as you can, as energized and punchy as you can, with using both hands to gesture. So one of our biggest games of, of, in the entire history was last year, Champions League semi-final. We were under the cosh. We, we were on the verge of getting knocked out. There was like seconds to go. Everyone was glued to their TV. I was actually under the duvet. Just couldn't bear to watch this. And then suddenly with three seconds to go, we break through, Lucas Mora scores. I just like throw off the duvet and go, yes, right? I wake up my eight-year-old daughter. She thought there was something, some, someone had broken in. But yes, Spurs were finally in the Champions League final. Great, great, fantastic. So that, what I love about that is that I've given you a little nudge, uh, yeah. but hopefully what everyone can see is that you're doing it with your personality. Sometimes people think, I don't want to pretend to be someone else. No one ever is. All I'm saying is be uh, try being a more energized, emphatic version of you, which is exactly what we saw there. And so uh, you don't need to use it all the time, but the message that I give to people on this, which is even more important now that we're virtual, is that you've got to consider in a conversation not just what do you want people to know or what do you want them to do, but how do you need them to feel? That human connection is missing. We're at a distance with each other. So we have to work harder at this in order to make sure that the, the emotional connection that we have with each other is there. And sometimes you'll find, I'm sure that you, you'll find this, um, is that sometimes you'll go and speak to one person and it goes well and you get the right reaction. You then say the same thing to somebody else and you get a bad reaction. And what we tend to do is to blame the other person and say, well, there's something wrong with them. Everybody else liked it. But actually what we need to be mindful of is uh, that sense of, okay, what does this person need from me? Are, are they reacting when I'm being softer? Are they reacting when I'm more considered or are they reacting when I'm more energized? And you can play around with those different aspects of you, aspects of your communication style until you reach one where you think this one seems to be working for them. So I'll give you an example of this where uh, I was uh, I was working with a client in the UK and the head of Australia for this company uh, came over, saw us in action a few years back. And he said, I, I really want you to uh, 
to, to, to re, uh, work with our team in Australia. I want you to pitch to me. And so I gave him the pitch. Now, my, my style is uh, generally quicker and more energized, more towards that sort of motivational piece we were just trying there. And uh, about a year later, he called me back. So we didn't get it. Uh, he called me back and he said, look, we've tried working with two other companies in Australia and they just can't do it. I want you to pitch to me again. And I thought, I'm sure I hit the wrong wavelength with him. He's very laid back, like super relaxed Australian mode. And so I said, OK, let's have a meeting where for him, I think it was eight o'clock in the morning. For me, it was 11 o'clock at night. So I thought I'm going to be least energized. He's going to be most energized. And I just I sat in my office. I put my feet up on the desk and I was just moving my gestures super slowly to remind me to ease my pace of voice down, be more on his wavelength, pitch the same message. And at the end, he said, I think you guys really understand what we need. I'm going to fly you out first class to Australia to come and train my my team on the Gold Coast. And we went out to this five star hotel with like these breathtaking views of palm trees every day. Uh, but it was about not that the message was wrong, not that we couldn't deliver what he wanted, but my style of communication that first time around hadn't matched what he needed. And it was such a powerful lesson uh, for me. So so it's always worthwhile thinking, what style do I usually have? And that's not you. That's not your identity. It's just habit. And then think, well, what other habits could I create so that if I'm in a meeting and it's not quite engaging people, I could shift there, which which now is important more than ever, that, that we're just able to shift and adapt and engage people as much as we can with the emotional side of the conversation, uh, even though we're not not in the same room. Mm, wonderful wonderful advice. advice. And I have to say, I really yeah, love really that. Love that. Um, um, before we go on to some other questions, questions, just a reminder to uh, listeners, if they want to pop any questions for Richard, asking about, again, things like how do you increase your, change your tempo or very you know, little tactics or tips, please put them in the comments. Richard, we talked a bit a lot about that sort of individual communications, um, but I wanted to move more towards, you know, on an organizational level. And I think we've heard so much about Zoom fatigue uh, yeah. within teams. So do you think this is something that oh, we're going to be stuck with permanently? Or if you're a team leader or CEO, is there something that you can do you know, differently to just energize the workplace? Great. OK, yeah, so some really good question. I've also just seen, thank you, Evan, uh, for the question that's popped up here. So I'll, I'll answer both of those. Uh, so going first to Evan's question, eye contact virtually or should it be focused? on the camera or the screen. Uh, so so here's, the, here's the key to this. You need to be engaged with the people who are on your meeting. So you may notice uh, during this that when Conrad is asking me questions, I'm then looking at him on the screen so I can really feel the intention that he has behind this. I'll hear the tone of voice, but I can also see the body language of that. But then when I'm responding, I'm looking directly at uh, the camera lens so that you're getting a sense of eye contact coming back from me. So that there's a connection there. And that's much more important when you have a team of people who you're broadcasting to who then need to feel like you're looking at them. Otherwise, you'll be speaking to them doing this permanently, which we've seen some people even being interviewed on news interviews and they're at home and they're sort of looking at the monitor over here, thinking they're looking the person in the eye, but the camera is over here. So it's not to say you need to be fixated there. If occasionally I see sort of movement from other people I'm on the call with, I might just look down and think, OK, what's happening there to stay engaged? But give as much to the camera uh, as I can. Now, coming back to, you know, Zoom fatigue, uh, is, is that something that's 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 real that's going to happen? Uh, what we've really enjoyed, actually, in the process of training people, particularly the last three months, because uh, my team has gone through that whole massive learning curve that everybody did of how do you do the best version of Webex or Microsoft Teams or Zoom, what's going to make this work and what doesn't. And I've been really proud, actually, that a couple of training sessions we've done recently where I said to people, what is the most important thing you've learned? Uh, somebody said just a couple of weeks back, the most important thing I learned was not anything that you taught, but it was how you taught us. Uh, that uh, you know, with using different things where depending on the platform you're using, you can very often, when people are not speaking, there's coffee breaks or it's before someone speaks or there's an activity, you can be playing music, you can have some sort of video clip playing in the background, something that's just keeping an energy going 
uh, between people. You can uh, be engaging with chat boxes where uh, I have to say one of my favorite platforms for this, for doing a large scale event is Microsoft Teams because people can be engaging through the chat box. They can then be liking each other's comments, which you can't do on some of the other platforms. They can put memes in the chat box. And so what it's allowing is for people to you, you can get the feel of everyone in the room. So for me, you know, for 20 years, I, I've spoken on stage in front of hundreds of people at a time, but my ability to understand what they're thinking has rapidly improved because of these platforms. Because now I can say, how does everyone feel about this? And get 200 answers that come up so I can get a sense of, oh, well, that's how everyone feels. Now, not only are they staying connected with me, but they are then telling each other how they feel about those things in a way that if you're in a room, you'd very rarely get the person on that side telling the person on the other side how they're feeling. So they can stimulate and inspire each other while the speaker, me or somebody else, stimulates and inspires them as well. Uh, you know, I do certainly think that keeping things interactive is very important. We talk to people about getting everyone there engaged and sharing their voice at the beginning and frequently and getting people into small teams. So say if you've got 20 people, just bunch them up and into a group of three and let them have that conversation and bring it back into what, whatever else is happening. Uh, the big mistake I think that I'm seeing a lot of people do is, is that they'll just have one speaker after another, after another, everybody else has got their cameras off. It's just a bunch of slides and it's sort of mimicking the worst of what we used to see uh, when when it was live events, where I, I, I very often would be booked as the uh, uplifting after lunch speaker when the whole morning was, here's another speaker with a bunch of slides that frankly they could have emailed you. And here's another speaker with a bunch of slides they could have emailed you. So what I was seeing, I mean, even last week, I was part of an event where one speaker just shared their slides and there was very little interaction. The next speaker talking on the same kind of subject was entirely interactive asking little questions. What do you think this is? Where do you think this subject goes? What do you think the results were over here? And conversations and discussions came up because of that. So less broadcasting, more interaction uh, that was happening. So using music, thinking about ways to genuinely engage people and make sure that they're participating. So it's the entire energy of everybody who's there, not just uh, one person. Great advice. Great advice. I think we've got one, one question. question from Raymond. So Raymond asks, any recommendations on equipment? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, uh, yeah, I've got a few pieces of, of advice uh, on this in terms of uh, equipment. Uh, first thing that I would say is it's really important to uh, to have your, your laptop or your, your webcam at least raised. So uh, think about this in terms of equipment, what this might mean. You want to measure it so that you're looking eye to eye with people. You should measure from your eyes down to your desk, get the measurement, and then measure the height of your webcam to your desk. It should be exactly the same. That's how you can look eye to eye with people. Now, in order to do that, if you've just got a laptop, then you've got to lift the laptop up in front of you and you sort of be typing up here, which will feel a little bit uh, awkward. So I would very much recommend that people get an external webcam. And if you can get an external screen. So the way that the setup I've got is my laptop's down here, I've got another screen here and then I put the webcam on top of it. So by doing that, by having multi-screen, I appreciate not everybody uh, maybe maybe can uh, can afford to do that, but you can get relatively inexpensive ones. I mean, right at the beginning of lockdown, I've got a webcam that is, uh, I think, 20 pounds, 25 pounds, and it's an HD webcam. I've got a screen in front of me that you used to be in our office that nobody else is going to be using in the office for the meantime. So I just said, can I have that screen? put it in front of me, put the webcam there so I can type down here and look up there. And then when I'm doing presenting slides or something on, on WebEx or Teams, then I've got two screens in front of me. So I'm able to look at chat box, look at participants and, and do those things. So in terms of brand around that, there's not much I'd recommend. There's one piece uh, that's very useful for lighting. If you want to just check this out, I've got a ring light that's just behind my webcam. And if I turn it off, you can just see the little impact that we've got there. I've got a reasonable amount of lighting on me, but that one's uh, great. A few people on our team have this. I think the brand is Neewer, N-E-E-W-E-R. Again, it's about 15 pounds on Amazon. I ordered it from, but you can order it from wherever you'd like to. And uh, that gives you 
just a nice piece of light on you without shadows. I found that if I didn't have it, with just lighting above me, then I had shadows then pouring down onto my face. Not so good for all the teaching we're doing. A couple of people on the team have got little clip-on mics. Again, not expensive, 10 or 15 pounds, and it cuts out background noise, just allows you to have this. I personally have the, uh, the Blue Yeti mic, Blue Yeti mic, bit more money, it's about 75 pounds, 80 pounds, something like that, but just gives you a, a much uh, nicer depth of sound. So those are a couple of bits around it. But with the microphone, that's really down to you. The only thing I would really suggest is you need to figure out a way that you can raise your webcam to eye level height and have light the other side of it coming towards you. Don't have a window behind you or a window sort of over on this side because you'll just get shadow. No one will be able to see you. Uh, and the last piece, probably in terms of equipment, I, I have a backdrop behind me, some bookcases here because that was convenient for me. You don't need it. You can just have a, a blank wall behind you. Uh, but, you know, I would say, generally speaking, move away from virtual backgrounds because virtual backgrounds, you put a hand up and like several of your fingers disappear uh, as you move them. So if you can have it natural, that's the better way to go. Yeah, Richard, I, I've used newer and uh, I have a Blue Yeti mic, which I've donated to the office. So I can vouch that those two, those things are incredible value for money. So if you can just pop, pop a couple of, uh, save a couple of pounds and then invest in that. Um, before we go, actually, Richard, I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned about having all these multi-screens. What I find when I do that is my eyes tend to like wander. And <laughs> I only realize this when uh, I watch the recording of the video and I was like, oh my God, I look so shifty. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you, I, I guess the, I think a lot of people have this difficulty about how do I look into this piece of glass? Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. So uh, it, yeah, it's, it's key to, to avoid that sort of shifting around the screen if you can. And if you've got the faces of lots of people in front of you, then your eye line might be drawn down to, oh, what's Barbara doing over here? What's John doing over here? So a couple of very simple suggestions I have for people is that, uh, so this is how I do it uh, on Zoom or WebEx, is uh, that what I want to be looking at if it's people's faces or if it's uh, notes or slides, then I make sure that they are as close to the webcam as possible. So if it's on Zoom, I get like a little strip of people's faces just immediately below there on WebEx. We can get like a little grid of people just below the webcam. So I'm as close to the webcam as I can be. When I say important messages, I make sure it goes down the lens. And lastly, what I did early on with this, I'm now sort of broadcasting, you know, teaching people, coaching people a lot of the day. What I used to do was to have just behind the webcam, I literally had like a piece of paper with arrows saying, look here. <laughs> so that I could think, oh yeah, that's where I'm supposed to be looking. If I look down here, then John doesn't think I'm looking at him. He thinks I'm looking at my screen. Uh, so just a couple of simple things around that can help. One extra piece actually to share with you. Uh, this was this is like a uh, very simple trick that uh, one of our team came up with. If you've got notes and you're worried about looking down at your notes and then coming back up here, all you've got to do, take a piece of paper, cut a hole out of it, and then you can place <laughs> it over your webcam, and then people can see you through, through your notes. You just make it big enough you can do that, and then you're looking up here, and then you might glance at your notes and come back to it, but you're basically keeping your eye, eye line over where it needs to be. That's such great advice, Richard, and I'll bear that in mind to uh, up my virtual game. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, if, if you like what you hear from Richard, you can visit or you can find out more about the work that he does and Body Talk at this URL below. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. You've been such a great audience. We'll be back in two weeks time with another episode where we'll have MBA alums who started companies um, and they will talk to us about what it's like to start and grow a business during a global pandemic. So thank you very much and goodbye.